And, uh, and then after we're done, I'll post it to YouTube and, and you'll have that. I'm sorry that it won't be live for your students, but, um, that's fine. They probably are bored listening to me anyways. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> All right. Um, that's why I'm here actually, right? Is that you, now you're bored of Dr. Thompson speaking. So I'm going to fill in. That's, that is definitely the case. <laughs> All right. So today we have with us Graham Spice, who's an old friend of mine. And uh, he wears many hats, um, but one of the hats he wears is being a music technologist. And uh, he is a certified instructor for Ableton Live and a few other things. And as a producer and engineer, he has worked with big names, some world-class artists like Keith Urban, the Dirty Dozen Brass Band, Bela Fleck, Victor Wooten, Jeff Cotton, Coffin, Jimmy Herring, Scotty Mori, John Modeski, Jack Dangers, Lettuce, Marvin Stam and Trey Anastasio, along with engineers like Denny Purcell and Richard Todd. I hope I said their names right. Yeah. Um, he does his own um, producing in the area. He's also a great musician, guitar player, trumpet player, keyboard player. Um, he does it all. He, he he's a he's great at all of that stuff. So I'm extremely pleased to have him here today to talk to us about um, the subject at hand. And I'm not going to talk too long. I'm just going to turn it over to him. And I'll remind everybody um, who is not Graham Spice to mute your microphone. And we'll put the comments or the questions or excited emojis into the chat. And if if um, Graham chooses, he can um, he can answer those or he can he can dismiss them as not not relevant to his or not within his purview. So with that, I'm turning it over. Well, thanks very much. Um, always a pleasure to see some folks that are interested in cool stuff. Um, as Dr. Thompson said, I am uh, an old friend of his from way back when. We both went to Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. And um, uh, I'm, I'm here to talk uh, today about something that's kind of a, a recent interest of mine, which is interactive music. And there is a little bent into Ableton Live as well, so we'll um, kind of reference that throughout. And uh, it's my understanding that Ableton is going to provide some a little bit of support for you guys too. So um, maybe there'll be some some uh, swag coming your way here soon from from the uh, local Ableton guy down there in the southeast. Um, but anyways, uh, thank you for the introduction. I am at Shenandoah Conservatory, which is um, just outside of Washington D.C. Um, I am uh, in two departments, the MPRT department, the Music Production Recording Technology, and then I'm also the director of a new program, which is a Bachelor's of Arts in Recording and Audio Arts. So um, we have a music degree and a Bachelor's of Arts degree at Shenandoah Conservatory. And um, as Dr. Thompson mentioned, I am an Ableton certified trainer, have been for many, many years. I'm also an AVID certified instructor, so I do Pro Tools as well. And then um, recently, I've become a WISE certified instructor. And WISE is uh, something that we're going to be talking quite a bit about today. WISE is a middleware program that sits in between um, your gaming console and like your game play, right? So it's a, it's a sound engine. So um, as, as Dr. Thompson said, I am a musician uh, first and a music technologist second. Uh, we both went to Belmont University. I also went to IUPUI. I studied and worked in Nashville for many, many years. And then for the past uh, 14, I guess 15 now, I've been in uh, higher ed, first at Washington and Lee University, and now most recently at Shenandoah University. I don't claim to play trumpet very often, but I appreciate that shout out. Um, I generally stick with guitars and keyboards. Um, and uh, some of my other focuses are iOS apps. I'm really into um, iOS apps. Uh, applications for music um, and that's been a, a long love of mine I do a lot of remote recording studio live video stuff and then recently I've been getting really into this immersive audio for AR VR and video games so uh, as he mentioned I worked with the Dirty Dozen Brass Band um, recently produced the record for Jeff Sipe Trio Bela Fleck and the Flectones I worked on that Little Worlds record and then uh, even more recently a little known kind of a uh, grunge rock band called Space Case. I uh, produced a record for them, so shout out to them. 
And uh, as he mentioned, I've done some stuff with Keith Urban. This is my friend Nathan Barlow, who's in the band. And I created this instrument for him that they call the Phantom. It's been out on the past uh, two world tours with Keith Urban. And I just think it represents like a real um, paradigm shift for country music. He's definitely the first kind of like DJ sampling kind of uh, side man that's been on a on a large country tour and I just love this um you know <laughs> this image of him in front of the Grand Opera it's just wild to see uh, some something like that on that stage right so as you can see it's like four iPads and a bunch of other controllers it's all driven by Ableton Live and uh, it's a real fun opportunity something I'm really proud of to to be involved with. So I thought I'd start off just kind of like by asking a question because that's always fun to hear some people talk other than me. And so uh, my first question is just, wait, what do you think is the main difference or differences between music for film and music for a video game? And I know you all are hip to uh, Zoom, so you can disregard this. I think we have such few people, you probably just speak up uh, about what your thoughts are on that. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, game audio is interactive. Film music is linear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so does that make you think about things differently as you're composing for it, perhaps? You have to think about what the player will be doing during one instance while film is already planned out. Absolutely. Yeah, you're reacting to what the player is doing. That's very, very true, Paul. Good. Good. I think that kind of sums up what I would say, too. It's like the, the linear nature versus the interactive nature of the two. Um, just to kind of back up just a little bit, we'll talk about like kind of where this all came from, where it's where it's maybe going. Um, gaming consoles obviously started way back when with old Ataris and things maybe maybe even before that. And um, kind of the the constraints of those systems were pretty intense, right? They had very, very little memory. The processing power was very small. And then the uh, technology that they that they used to generate sound was also very, very minimal. Um, as things have been uh, getting, you know, accelerating in terms of technology, uh, we've seen that the audio can react in a similar way, right? We've been able to uh, go to full high resolution audio just like you would in a, in a music project. Um, we're seeing maybe even higher resolutions on modern game consoles and, and et cetera. But as you might imagine, as you get more space and more CPU power, uh, the games get more complicated too, right? So you're having more intense graphics. Um, the uh, physics of the game are being modeled uh, more, you know, acutely, etc. So there's always this trade-off in writing music for AR, VR applications or video games, and that we're balancing between what the limitations of the hardware is, and then how. I like this, how clever you are to go around those limits while still doing something artistically valid. So um, you think about game engines, the, the actual software that drives the game, and, and this is kind of what they're up against, like all these different pieces, right? Animation, physics, memory, localization, streaming of the audio or video, right? Uh, threading, multi-threading, um, artificial intelligence a lot of times. And of course, we're in the middle of that with the sound, and so we may, may have a sound engine that's creating the sound for us and then kind of putting that into or integrating with the game engine. So that's really where we are with this. And so as you might imagine, as sound designers for this style of delivery, we want to work with everybody, right? So we want to be able to work with lots of different game engines like Unreal and Unity, probably being the two largest. And then maybe you want to use some of your favorite plugins from ESP or Isotope or Steinberg or, you know, maybe you want to do stuff in Dolby Atmos. And then, of course, if you just think about the sheer number of platforms that are out there, right? You've got Oculus, PlayStation, um, et cetera, et cetera, PS4s, um, iOS. There's so much out there to be compatible with. And this is oftentimes why people want to subscribe to the idea of using a middleware software to drive the sound. Because if you need to uh, you know, format your, your sound for so many different platforms and engines, it might be helpful to utilize some software in the middle that has that kind of built in, that kind of that kind of integration built in. And that's really where WISE comes in. Um, WISE is just one of um, a few different middlewares that are out there. And that just kind of sits between the composer and the programmer, right? So uh, other examples of middleware software will include FMOD and Elias. 
And so just like rethink this, we're, we're living in between the programmer and the composer. So this implementer, this implementation in the middle um, kind of goes between the sounds and the video game. And that's where this middleware sits. And so uh, Dale Crowley at the Game Audio uh, Sound Con in 2015 said, learn to use it like an instrument. If you think about it, there's we spend so much time learning instruments and becoming uh, virtuosic at those. Uh, we also need to do that with our software, right? So if you really want to be competent in this area, um, learning to use the software like an instrument is really important. And that kind of references that's behind me here. The studio is a musical instrument. This is a quote from uh, Brian Eno. And he said at one point, he said, uh, what would happen if we put this sign in every recording studio around the world? Would it would it influence what comes out of those studios, right? And the same kind of concept here is just like, how do we learn to use this software like an instrument instead of just as a software implementation tool? So why might you want to bother learning middleware? It helps to shape the music you're going to write. Um, it allows you to integrate it into the games or the VR applications that you're going to be doing. Um, you can deliver music that will score a game similar to the way the film is scored. Um, obviously, the, the creative thing is really important here. And it might help you make money as a composer or sound designer by differentiating yourself from them. Because as you know, this is such a large uh, industry. If you think about the size of the gaming industry, it's basically larger than the music industry and the film industries combined, right? So it's a huge industry, kind of like on the on the on the area of like retail textiles or auto manufacturers. It's a much larger industry, and there's really, if you watch like what's happening in the um, employment world, there is a lot more opportunities right now for uh, composers, sound designers, audio engineers to go into uh, AR, VR, and video games than there are to go into standard music applications or films. So with that in mind, I, this is kind of why I'm interested in it is because there's a lot of opportunity for my students to get involved with this. I watch the job postings pretty closely because I think it's really telling as to where we are. And um, this is a major, major area that I see the postings coming from is sound design, composition, audio engineering, um, technical sound work, uh, Foley work, et cetera, for AR, VR, and video games. So um, let's see, if I could have one of my friends out here, how about Andrew? Uh, well, we heard from Andrew already, and we heard from Paul. Tyler, if you're on the line, if you could read this quote for me, I'd appreciate it. I'll try to do this. My connection's kind of spotty, but so why learn middleware helps to shape the music that you write. Wait, I think my slide is better. There it is. Audio okay. middleware lets you focus on what you want to do rather than asking how you can do it. And it enables you to create complex audio system on your own. And moreover, though these tools are always designed by sound designers themselves. Thank you very much. So I like this idea that tools are designed by sound designers right as opposed to like a game programmer who's like oh i think i'll dabble in sound on the side it, it really helps us to kind of um recognize that these tools are designed for us to use and so with that in mind let's kind of continue on here so from a high level view of interactive music it's very very simple what we're trying to achieve we're trying to achieve essentially sound or composition that reacts to the game mechanics of the game. So if we think about it from a video game perspective, you might just have basically two states, right? You've got maybe a stealth state. I'm just throwing this out there as an idea. Maybe game state A is stealthy and game state B is like fighting, right? And so we're always just going in between those two states. And so that presents us with at least two different um, composition styles that we may be working in. And then oftentimes in games, we have a story that's kind of um, put in between uh, the game states. So you might imagine that in between game state A and game state B, we might get a little backstory about the characters. Maybe we meet the princess for the first time or the princess is then, you know, 
uh, stolen away by the villain and we have to kind of like become emotionally attached to that story. And so there are some other uh, areas where we might want to create unique uh, sounds or compositions, right? So now we have a couple different places where we built maybe some music for this game. And now what are we going to do? We need to also think about the transitions between. Um, are we going to just force a quick transition? Are we going to write material that would sit in there in the transition? And so that's basically, in a real nutshell, the whole interactive music story is like we've got couple different spots where we're going to create music for and then we have some transitional moments and we want to uh, we want to be in control of all that right and so what options do we have for those transitions even we have maybe a source and a destination so how do we get from this place to that place uh, maybe at the source we could exit at some particular spot so immediately we're just changed or at the next bar the next beat maybe you put in a cue uh, that really works from the source to the destination so you get the idea where like you get to choose how you're going to leave the source right and then where are we going to enter the destination is there an entry queue that re relates to the source and that's a very clear place to move or would it be at the exact same time? So we're at, you know, bar three, beat four, and that's where we change in the destination as well. And it goes right to that spot because you're using the same BPM, you're using the same key center, and you can easily switch between the two, right? So that'd be an option. And then, of course, we could write a, a whole new transition to transmission to transition between the source and the destination. So those might be your options for the transition itself. And Ableton Live, I think, has a real similar um, feature in that you can control the quantization of when you switch between, say, for example, this clip to that clip or this scene to that scene. Um, you can say, I want it to happen on the bar. I want it to happen every half note. Uh, when I click, I want it to happen on the quarter note. Um, so it does have similar options. I, I'm trying to draw these parallels between... Um, what I see is kind of like the generic ideas of interactive music and then very specific things in Ableton Live that remind me of some connection between the two. And so as you might imagine, the real struggle here is to keep this music interesting enough. You think about how much music the 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 gamer might be sitting in front of right uh if you think about a game that has a story mode where it's very clear like this is the beginning this is the ending and everything in between then you might be playing between six and 15 hours something like that um and that would be a very uh kind of limited run at that but then there are of course multiplayer games where you, i'm sure you know people that play like call of duty two or three hours a night i mean if you do that that's going to be a thousand hours a year right that you're <laughs> listening to this game so how how do you generate enough material to make that uh, interesting and not make you want to turn the soundtrack off? And you also think, well, maybe you've only been hired as a composer to create one or two hours of music. Like, how do you step from there into these kind of infinite possibilities? And uh, that is really where um, we look to these three different elements for solving this. I think the first element is is you all as the composer, right? This first element is like, how do you create music that is variable enough? Okay. Then we've got the sound engine. So this middleware program will give us some features and options to put variability into the music that we write. And then, of course, we actually have the game mechanics that we can build off of, too. So how do we react to the player that runs through all the levels really fast versus the player that you know slowly goes through methodically is very stealthy and and looks at every corner of the room and stuff like that uh, in theory their soundtrack should sound very different right uh, they shouldn't sound similar so the game mechanics uh play a big role here I think if we just focus initially on the composition, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I think that you all are knowing uh, in the know of what this means. So uh, it would be great to compose with various tempos um, that will help to reduce kind of like the listener fatigue. Um, it's always a good idea in these situations to write in alternate time signatures, right? So you get something in five, you get something in seven, and it doesn't feel quite as repetitive. And then if you can avoid rhythmic patterns like riffs, especially like short drum loops that are going to, you know, if you've got a four second drum loop that's going to play for 20 minutes, 
everybody's going to get tired of it. You know, also I would say like riff oriented stuff. Like if you had don't, 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 don't over and over and over again, that's also going to get old. So combining those three kind of uh, options within the composition would be good ideas just to you know, like think about. Um, then you think about inside of the game engine, what are some of the options? Obviously, we've got similar things to what you might have in other DAWs, right? You've got pinch, pitch and transposition. You can change volume. You can add effects. Um, and then you can add some variability into your melodies and harmonies. You can randomize them. You can sequence them in a certain order. Or you can use switches from the game to modify it. Um, but it all really starts with the ability to have music segments that can loop gracefully. And so let's dive into that just a little bit. Here is George Crumb's The Magic Circle of Infinity Sheet Music. I love that. It's like, is that a loop? I think that's a loop. Wow, he wrote a loop. Isn't that wonderful? Um, so uh, the old way of looping, how does, this, how does this work? Obviously, you know, we've got this kind of like end point here that we're really concerned about with because in our music, we know that our, our little sample that we created from, from our composition doesn't end there, right? It has, it has a, tr a tail at the end. Maybe there's some reverb or some, some instrument is kind of holding out the notes at the end. So the old way we used to do is we used to just kind of like cut that off and then fold it back over to the beginning and fade it in so that we maintain that crash symbol or whatever it was at the end. Of course, the problem here is, is that nobody wants to hear that crash symbol every single time, right? <laughs> but anyways, I defer to the idea that you can still do this. Um, in Ableton Live, they have an option called render as loop in the export. So if you want to do this type of um, thing to, to bounce the leftover tails to the beginning of the loop, you would just turn that switch on when you export and it will do that for you. So you certainly can still work in this way. Um, well, working with Ys allows you to set an entry point and an exit cue. So when we have those ideas, we have the ability to deal with pickups and releases, right? And so rather than have to bring the release over to the entry, uh, we have the ability to say, this is where we want to start and this is where we want to end. And so that's great when you are looping segments because instead of it kind of like playing over top of itself, it actually will allow you to choose the sync point and let the end of segment A kind of uh, move over the top of the repeated segment A, right? And that will happen again and again and again. So you don't have to uh, create samples that have the end point looped back at the beginning. Now we can allow the um, the middleware to deal with this. And so that's great when you're looping a segment, but also when you're branching segments. So if you're going from segment A to segment B, you also have the ability to let the tail of segment A uh, roll over a different segment too, right? So as you keep going, you can see the, the kind of idea there. And so that's wonderful because then you don't ever have to think about that anymore. It's like, okay, the program itself is going to take care of the tails or the exit points uh, automatically. And that can be really, really convenient for, for, comp for composers. And so what does that look like in Ableton Live? We can uh, render all individual tracks at once with just a simple uh, click. Then um, we can also accommodate uh, entry cues and things like that if you start your export just a couple of bars before and after the loop. So then you get your entry and your exit cues available to you. Um, if you're using reverb tails or you know a diminishing cymbal crash, etc., something in a large room that might have some reverb on it. Um, and then if you're using uh, effects tracks, so you're using send and return effects, you're going to want to to export those combined with the source clips too. So there's a, a, a button that you'd want to hit in the rendering options called include return and master effects that will print those effects onto your export, which is very convenient, right? So that's how you might work within Ableton Live to get sounds out that will work well in WISE. Now, this is what the segment editor looks like in WISE. It looks very, very similar to a standard DAW layout, right? We've got all of our audio tracks here. You can see we've got stereo audio tracks. We've got our enter, entry and exit cues. We've kind of lined that up and everything is lined up perfectly. It looks very, very similar to the DAW. Now you might be thinking, okay, why would I do that? We started off talking about like the limitations of um, the console and computers and 
why would I want to have individual tracks? It seems like that would kind of take down um, the system m m easier or we would kill resources or however you want to think about it. It takes up uh, the, the computing power, right? Um, well, there are very, very important reasons to do this. And I think one of the persons mentioned this at the beginning of the lecture, which was how do we react to the actual gameplay? Right, and that's where real-time parameter controls can come in. We can receive information from the game and then have the playback of the audio react to that. So in WISE, they're called RTPCs, or real-time parameter controls. What does that look like? You can see uh, this white line is actually pointed over to the voice volume, and I could say assign something to the voice volume. So say, for example, the stealth factor kind of uh, goes up. So uh, you're getting closer and closer to being recognized by the guards or something like that. As that happens, I can slowly add volume to certain parts of my composition, right? Um, so. Uh, what does that look like exactly in in the RTPC display? Well, you can see that we've kind of got this XY graph here. One side is voice volume and the other axis is stealth factor, right? So as we gain in volume, we're going to gain in stealth factor also. When you want to um, just kind of audition this in the program, you see this little red box up here that says stealth factor. You can literally just move that to the left and right to emulate what this sound might be doing in the game. And so that gives you some kind of real time understanding of what it looks like. Now let's uh, look at this short video to, to actually see it in action. I'm in WISE and I have attached on two of the tracks, I have attached an RTPC, a game parameter. So that's my stealth factor on the x-axis and it's driving the volume. So in real time, the game is actually just modulating this value as it does for the AI and it could sound like that. You're in the dark. You're exposed. You start to get the idea of how that can be utilized um, in a game, right? It's going to react to the information that you're receiving back from the game engine. So obviously that's not quite going to give us enough variability to have a composition go from two hours of music to unlimited, infinite uh, amount of music. So uh, now we're going to start to get into the game engine itself and the middleware to see what more can we do, right? So here we have a music segment in WISE that shows us we've got, for example, four bass tracks. We've got three brass tracks, a single drum track, and then three piano tracks. These are essentially like takes or different ideas that you've recorded in, in advance of this. And of course, you'd want to, to allow them to all work together in a, in a similar way. So you could, for example, randomize these first four bass lines. You could say, just choose one every time you play it back, just choose a random one. Uh, you could also say, I want these brass tracks to play in sequence. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, over and over and over again. I could add a switch to the piano track that might react to the character that's uh, that's playing, right? So, like for example, if you think of like a Mario example, um, maybe the switch is that the character is small, so you'd play the first one, they get taller, you play the middle one, and then they turn into a fireball, and you play the third one, right? So that kind of gives you some idea from um, the middleware as to some variability that you could add into this space. I find that that looks very, very similar to follow actions in Ableton Live. You, If you're just getting introduced to Ableton Live, you may not have come across follow actions, but that's a way to provide kind of some randomness or even some control over which clips get uh, chosen to play in the session view. So you could say, uh, after you play this clip, I'd like you to go to the next clip every time or I'd like you to play this clip again, or I'd like you to go to any clip and play any clip that's in this column. Or if we have certain clips that are backed up on top of each other, I'd like you to go to the last one that is a kind of a, a, co a cohesive group together, right? So that gives you the ability to choose, kind of add some variability into your playback in Ableton Live, which to me looks very, very similar to what happens in WISE and how it reacts to 
uh, a switch that might be coming from the game. Uh, obviously, these programs can also deal with MIDI. So we could have uh, MIDI in, in different tracks that could also be reacting in real time to uh, game parameters that we receive. So um, there are uh, virtual instruments that can be installed into the game engine that can play back MIDI information. And you could even you know, assign real-time game parameters to come in and control LFO speed or attack and release or all the kind of different parameters that you might find in a, in a MIDI controllable virtual instrument. That's still not enough. That's still not enough variability to give us the uh, the kind of uh, randomness that we need to generate long form interactive compositions. So now let's look at organizing uh, your music or your uh, your segments into playlists. So here's a regular segment. We've got one, two, three, four, five different tracks going to play back. Let's say we put that segment into a playlist, and now we have five of those, right? So we've got a collection of those that then can also be sequenced or randomized. I want it to play ABCD, then it's sequenced. I want it to randomize any of those, right? So then we could add some more, uh, some more ideas. So we could add a playlist, which contains segments, which contain tracks. And then we could define some transition rules to switch between what might be in playlist A versus what's in playlist B. And so now we have some more options in terms of, oh, playlist A is going to randomize its segments and playlist B is going to sequence its segments, right? So kind of just ways to deal with that. Plus, we can define the transitions between the two. The next step of this that I kind of think is fun to talk about, especially to music students, is the game mechanics. The game mechanics is just how is the game built and how are we going to react to that? I think that the game mechanics uh, are very, very similar to what we consider musical form. So let's look at some typical musical form. We've got a rondo form, right? Everybody remembers that or maybe doesn't. <laughs> We've got the sonata allegro form. We've got exposition and development or re your recap, right? Then we have a 12-bar blues format, just standard one, four, fives. In 12 bars then we've got a rock form right so you got intro verse verse chorus verse solo chorus outro you want to make a pop song just take the solo out so you've got these standard typical musical forms that we react to as composers and performers we know how this is going to work right so we can do the same thing with interactive music in that we look at the musical forms in the same way let's look at what we call sequencing or horizontal uh, form. This is kind of a standard gaming idea where you have an introduction, you go to stage one, then you might have a transition that takes you to stage two when you, if you win. If you lose, of course, you're going to go down to defeat and you're going to have to go back to stage one. Um, maybe you win stage two, then you go to another transition and you go to stage three. And finally, if you don't get defeated, uh, you are victorious, right? Um, now, underneath my face here, you can see that um, I've actually put up a little graph, a little graphic from Ableton Live that is showing that I think that this uh, horizontal kind of layout is very similar to the arrangement view of Ableton Live. That's uh, very much a left to right kind of linear view at music, right? Um, f just like a multi-track tape. And... Uh, we are considering these horizontal sequencing techniques. We're going from this section to this section to this section. So kind of exactly kind of where we're coming from. Dennis DeSantis, who's in charge of documentation for Ableton Live, created this book called Making Music, 74 Creative Strategies for Electronic Music Producers. The book is fascinating. It's broken into three different segments um, that kind of deal with problems that as any music uh, composer or producer comes across. The first problem being the blank page. How do I deal with the blank page? The second problem is how do I generate enough ideas to create a full song? And then, of course, the third problem is uh, how do I know that I'm finished? When do I know that I'm done, right? <laughs> how do I know that I did a good job on this? So let's see. Um, Larry, if you're around, can you read this uh, quote for me?
tell you what, if Larry's not available, I'm going to turn it over to Andres. Will you read that for me, Andres? Yes. Contrast is created through layering, the careful addition and subtraction of parts in order to change the density of the underlying texture. Thank you, Andres. Um, what I failed to mention here is that Dennis DeSantis's book, The 74 Creative Strategies, is now available for free. Um, it's not an Ableton book necessarily. It basically is talking about how to create music. Um, so I highly recommend you check that out. I'm going to provide you with these slides afterwards, and that link down there at the bottom will take you to a download. You can download it in PDF, EPUB, all these great formats, and, and et cetera. So what Dennis is trying to say here is that layering is what develops contrast, right? And so uh, with the addition and subtraction of parts. And now you notice that my graphic up here from Ableton Live has switched, right? I'm no longer on the arrangement view, and I'm thinking much more about the session view here. So uh, there was this guy in Nashville, Tennessee, named uh, Leroy Banana, who wrote a song called Five Smiles. And I think it's a great example of layering. Uh, in just the first few seconds, you see, you can see down below, I've created this um, timeline that shows when the elements are added. And you can kind of see this stair-stepping idea. And here's an example. Not to belabor that, but um, I just thought it was uh, kind of a fun opportunity to talk about uh, some of Dr. Thompson's uh, compositions. Hope you enjoyed that, John. And uh, so, what does this look like in a real game? How do we layer things in a way that reacts to the game? Well, let's think about the threat level. Like we're playing this kind of shoot up game and you're in the corners and you're trying to be stealthy. And as you slowly get less stealthy and the threat level increases, that can modulate track volumes, right? So what does that look like on a, on a kind of a standard graph? Uh, we might be going up in terms of the proximity or awareness to the people that are looking for us, the creatures that are looking for us, and we've divided this into six different levels. And so this is just to be a standard example that might play over a period of uh, uh, 75 seconds as listed here. This might be what the game is actually returning to you, the information. So you're slowly kind of going up and then down and up and then down and up and way up. So you finally get to level six and you wouldn't want to stay at level six for very long, right? It's so chaotic. It's so over the top that you're not going to um, want, you're not going to be super comfortable there, right? So uh, in addition to that, you might have little stingers that, that kind of let you know that you're getting to this next level, right? Letting you know that you're about to get to level four or you're about to get to level six so those might be like you know a trombone glissando or some kind of like drum fill letting you know that you're kind of on your way to this next level and so I think you can kind of get the idea of what this what this might might look like but let's see it actually happen in a game this is a game called alien isolation where um, you're kind of like as the game player you're in stealth mode and you're trying to hide out but eventually you start to get um, kind of uh, seen by the aliens, right? So this is what this, uh, oh, whoa, sorry, hold on. I didn't mean to do that. Pop me right out of there. Okay, this is what the, uh, the game looks like. Whoa, it's going to continue doing that. Okay, I think I might have a solution to that. There we go.
There. I'll collect my things and we can leave. It's not necessarily the type of game I'm going to be playing very often, but it gives you some idea of kind of how this layering works, how the heard maybe some stingers right before something, uh, another layer would come up. And then as the alien walked away, we went down in the threat level and we kind of removed some of the sound or the volume of different segments that we were listening to. So that kind of gives you some idea of what that looks like. Here's an example from Rockstar Games. This is a re recent release of theirs from Red Dead Redemption 2. Um, interestingly enough, the entire soundtrack of the game is composed in 130 BPM and in the key of A minor. So this really relies on new elements coming in and out to react to the gameplay, right? So we would hear things like um, riding a horse generates a bass line or chasing... Uh, generates timpanies, right? Or shootouts generate electric guitars. So it's, a, it's an exciting kind of way to think about it. They really took this, I think, kind of as far as it can go. This is uh, one of those classic Rockstar games that you can play for years and years and years and not get tired of it. And so how would they address that problem, right? So this is an interesting solution as well, is to just uh, have so many different um, layers that react to the gameplay that it, it continues to sound fun, right? Um, also what might happen in uh, a live performance, you might be able to, uh, put the session grid in Ableton live, um, into, uh, a, a, a way that reacts to the vertical layering techniques that we're talking about. So this example from galaxy, uh, the Andrew, uh, Rohrman composer as known as scientific, uh, organized sounds and real time parameters from the game on the session grid of Ableton Live. And it's shown here with a Novation launch pad. So he has these different kind of ideas uh, organized across the session grid. And so let's see what he has to say in terms of how he explains that. Uh, the ideas uh, set the tone. You know, you drop into a new level. Well, this is pretty cool. Uh, might be some danger. So you're flipping around. Uh, you can add parts to it, up at uh, intensity or not. But maybe the player, since we're not, they can totally roam freely. Maybe they do just shoot out into space and they don't get into a fight. So then we go back to this and it's just mellow and they're running around shooting asteroids. No big deal. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, so yeah, mellow, but maybe you are even out in the asteroid field and you come across some bugs. So the bugs uh, engage. They've got a little synth that uh, says, okay, if you're fighting bugs, maybe the action ramps up. Yeah, here's the thing. I can hold it. So you can just keep okay. <laughs> so anyway, so there's some more action. Uh, maybe the bugs come back. Uh, you're fighting them. It's going all right, but then, oh, then some pirates show up. Yeah, that's going well. Uh, then maybe, uh, kill all the bugs. Pirates can kill all the bugs. Now you're just fighting them. Uh, okay, beat up all the pirates. Okay, good, but it's still intense. Uh, the battle's still going on. You're killing your last few uh, enemies. And then, you know, a little relief. Okay, we've got some downtime. We can maybe shoot around the caves still. Maybe there's a few things left to do. Uh, but the action has uh, dropped down a notch. Um, again, tons of options here. Maybe you've uh, accomplished whatever the level mission is. Uh, it's done, so there's a little kind of victory dance for you. And you're leaving the caves and uh, back into the asteroid field. 
So that's an example, very condensed, and again, me kind of talking through it, how the system uh, works. So I'm really seeing a lot of um, relationships between the session view of Ableton Live and this style of interactive composition. And essentially, Scientific just played the game as though you were playing it right on an Ableton push. And it was just organized in the way that he showed where you have the ability to um, add different elements or just play an entire scene depending on where you are in the game, right? So uh, very similar to the session view in Ableton Live. So if I was going to recap what we talked about today, I would say, first off, we talked about how um, games or VR experiences are very, very simple in, in base level. Uh, we've got your game state A, your game state B, maybe some story events. And then we talk about what are the transitions? How are we going to manage those transitions? Do we write unique material for them, et cetera? And then we talked about music variability and where that comes from. It starts with you all as the, comp as the composer, and then you can work with your sound engine, your middleware to kind of like help develop uh, variability and then also react to the game mechanics, right? So any, any information that's coming from the game in terms of uh, we're in the battle scene versus we're in the uh, stealth scene, uh, that kind of information can be taken into the sound engine and reacted to, right? Then we talked about the two different styles of composition. Um, these, of course, are based off of the game, right? If the game lends itself to something that is horizontal versus vertical or sequencing versus layering. Um, the gameplay or the VR design will let you know which one to use. And I'm, I'm suggesting that the sequencing or the horizontal method is similar to the arrangement view in Ableton Live and the layering vertical idea where you add different um, pieces to like the th in reaction to a threat level or something like that is very similar to the session view of Ableton Live. Um, uh, just to kind of like a final note here, like if you're inspired to learn more about middleware, uh, you might be surprised to know that you already know a lot of techniques that will work here. And so I think this is wonderful for all of us who are challenged with learning new stuff right now. It's like, oh, finally, there's some light at the end of the tunnel of all the time that I put in to get here. I can then kind of take some of those techniques out and utilize them uh, in middleware and in interactive music. Um, also, let's not look at it as a roadblock. It can be inspiring. I've been playing music, uh, as Dr. Thompson has, for you know 30 plus years, and maybe I'm a little tired of my own ideas. Maybe I'm a little tired of my licks and my riffs and you know all, of, all my soloing ideas, and maybe my inspiration is not as inspired as it once was. So what a, a fantastic way to rethink the way that I'm designing or composing music by doing it in middleware, right? So get out of the DAW, utilize the middleware as this instrument, and maybe that kind of gives us a new way of thinking about music, just like the instrument, right? We got to practice it. You can download all of these uh, middlewares for free and try them all out. Wise is free, FMOD is free, and Elias is free. On that uh, initial page that I had, there are links to all three of them. So uh, you can try them all out and see which one appeals to you. Um, I personally got involved with Wise because there's a very clear educational bent to that company. And so I was able to go through some certifications very, very, that were uh, guided, right? Guided certif certifications that helped me kind of get my head around it and understand it better. Um, and so if that's something that you're interested in, I can be involved or I can at least provide you with the resource and show you the way um, to learning wise. They have a basic 101 certification course. Um, you don't pay any money for the actual course. So that's kind of another huge benefit, I think, is that if you want to get into this, you can download all the content and go all the way through any of their certifications and learn the content. And if you don't want to take the certification exam, fine, because that's what actually costs money. So if you don't want to do that, that's fine. But if you do become certified, they have a creator's directory and a, and, and a content provider list where you can explain your services, and so, et cetera. So there's my uh, email address if anybody wants to reach out and learn more about getting the WISE certification. Um, and finally, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Simon Ashby, who is the VP of uh, Audio Kinetic 
for providing uh, me invaluable assistance with this presentation. His presentation called A Crash Course on Interactive Music. It's fantastic. Um, and I pulled a lot of my material from there. It helped me kind of understand and make those connections between uh, my musical background and interactive music. So that's that's really what got me most ex inspired to, to get involved with this. In addition to that, I've got a ton of other references and resources here. So if you're interested in kind of finding textbooks that are about that or websites that make sense, etc., cetera, um, those are all great links. So um, I do have some other material to share if you're interested, but um, I thought this was probably a good time to slow it down and kind of turn it over to questions or kind of thoughts, um, reactions. I have not looked at a single um, <laughs> chat here, so hopefully there's some cool stuff in there to react to. Um, but uh, does anybody have any thoughts about this? Anything that you want to bring up? Well, I'll jump in for a second and say thank you. That was a great presentation, uh, very clear. And uh, the thing that came to my mind was um, we've been talking about interactive music in the context of Max MSP right now, so kind of... Um, hitting it at a very difficult, nothing is given to you level. <laughs> and part of the reason for doing that is that to create infinite worlds, um, that implies that you can't actually know uh, what's going to happen, right? Um, and, and you actually probably don't have to write all the material for that. You maybe have to write the process for generative material. Um, so that's just what came to my mind. And I, and I wondered about um, there's a lot of questions in the chat, so I'm going to let you address those, but um, I, I don't know why I'm doing this, but <laughs> but I'm curious what you think uh, this looks like in 10 years, you know, or, or 15 years. What is this? What does this look like? Or I guess you could frame that in like, what does the middleware look like? What does Ableton Live look like in 15 years? And and is that driven by compositional or or needs of the industry? Yeah, that's a, I like the last half of that question, especially it's like when you compare um, the way that certain DAWs deal with this, um, there are other DAWs like Steinberg Nuendo that actually have like major pieces of interactive gaming involved there. So they it gets kind of in between the middleware and the DAW and helps you with like file naming and keeping everything kind of together in that way. Um, another thing that uh, Nuendo does really well, which is kind of similar as it does. It has a whole like tool in there for ADR. So if you're interested in post-production for video um, and you're doing a lot of ADR, it has an entire tool set in there for, for, for doing that with. Um, Pro Tools and Ableton Live are a little bit more limited in terms of how well they plug in directly to middleware. And I think that um, my soapbox with Ableton in particular is like, this is such a huge opportunity. We need to figure out better ways to um, integrate with the middleware applications or maybe just bypass the middleware application and go straight to a game engine, right? So figure out a way that um, Ableton Live can can plug in directly to Unity and Unreal, right? That might be an even, even fancier, cooler step to, to take. Um, Pro Tools obviously needs to go down that road as well. And then there's other applications like Reaper that um, there have been third party people who have developed some uh, very cool things in Reaper that combine uh, Unity and Unreal with Reaper. So um, it's not to say that it's not out there. Um, and there are some examples in some other DAWs, but I think that... Um, I th and this is just kind of like my little soapbox. I think that, that Ableton Live needs to step it up a little bit in terms of its support for this. Um, to get to your max MSP kind of portion of that, um, Unity and Unreal are a programming, you know, a programming language based engines. So you can easily take some of the things that you've programmed, I would assume, in max MSP and then program them into Unreal or Unity um, based upon their programming languages. Um, similarly, obviously Ableton Live loves Cycling 74 and there's a real tie there. So Max for Live is an easy kind of transition. If you're doing stuff in, in Max, it should come right into Live uh, without a whole lot of trouble. I think that um, a great example of where Max um, is clearly superior to Live right now is in multi-channel. Uh, live does not support multi-channel and natively. Um, so there are some workarounds within Max for Live for dealing with like Ambisonic and uh, 
uh, Dolby Atmos, etc. I think that um, those are really places that are that our industry is running in very very quickly towards uh, multi-channel audio. I think that um, Dolby Atmos now that you can go to Best Buy and purchase stuff that it has. Uh, is has the ability to play back Dolby Atmos. I think we'll start to see that more and more in people's homes. Uh, that said, people don't really care where they place their speakers, so that's always kind of a confusing situation. But um, you know, being able to access height channels and things like that within the within the ecosystem of Ableton Live would be really helpful. And I think that I think that we're going to be seeing that. I, I actually have a meeting in three days with the uh, with the other Ableton certified trainers, where I am expecting to hear some some news about some latest greatest kind of releases that are about to to come out. Um, that I'm really excited about, and something that I've been kind of pushing for internally is we've got to up our game uh, in terms of Ableton Live support for multi channel audio. And then if there is some possibility of creating combinations or integrations with game engines or middleware, I think that that's a real opportunity there uh, to, to work, you know? And I see that um, the connection works with why specifically. Absolutely, Andrew. Yep. Yep. That's a, that's a good one. I'd see I see a lot of people using Nuendo, although it's just, you know, it's funny. It's not the most well-supported DAW in the community. I don't understand why other than it. Pro Tools just still is that pillar of post-production, right? It's like you, it's hard to compete with that. Um, with with it's it's so well uh, supported in the film and video world. I think in particular that's kind of a lot of people in gaming and VR come from film and video, so they're kind of coming from that background. Also, just kind of getting back to the cer certification thing, Pro Tools and Avid have had this long history of providing certifications, and you can't do that as far as I know in Nuendo or certainly not in Reaper. So um, those are some some other places, right? There are actually a ton of game audio implementation jobs out there. Absolutely. Yep. How do you make good connections in this market? Great question, Paul. I love that question. He left, but you can tell him that um, the best way to do this is to join a game jam. Uh, game jams are these local uh, or not so local. You can do it through the Internet, of course, too. Um, we host uh, one every year in January. Do you guys do that, too, there? Okay, there's a something called a global game jam where uh, you can host that on your campus. And it's like a 48 hour period where you get together with um, programmers and artists and uh, all sorts of, you know, story writers, all sorts of people that want to be involved in games. And you create a game in 48 hours and you can hopefully get some sleep, but not required. And uh, you usually like have one location that everybody kind of like hangs out in and works together in. Um, so that's a really cool opportunity. And then they have game jams all over all over the world. And um, I can provide you with the link, I think, in my multiple tabs here um, to this website that has kind of like every single game jam in the world listed. Uh, and I'll find that while you guys ask. Here it is. Itch, Itch.io is the name of the website. Uh, age bias. I love that question, Ryan. Absolutely not. In If you compare this industry to the industries of music and film and video, where you cannot get into the industry unless you uh, sling some coffee and clean some bathrooms, that is not happening in this industry at all. They are looking for new blood really bad. Like people that are interested in games have the kind of backgrounds that we're talking about like you have a background on max msp and you have a background in wise like you are almost guaranteed if you have a little bit of a portfolio you're almost guaranteed an entry-level job into this area um and you don't always have to relocate either some of the, some of these jobs are remote um that said the major places to live um in the united states for this vary so much compared to music and film there is a major contingent in central North Carolina, in Maryland, in Toronto, in uh, Chicago, in um, Austin. So places that you might not normally think of as being, you know, music centers or technology hubs, they are the homes to like really large gaming companies. And I'm also really heavily involved in AR, VR development here in my area. And 
that is a really growing industry as well. In the past six months, I haven't really taken any music jobs. I'm only been on the side, you know, I've only been taking AR VR jobs on the side because they're so uh, frequently, they have the needs that I bring to the table. I do um, ambisonic uh, recordings. Uh, we're shooting 360 video. Um, I am doing uh, ambisonic mixing, right? So I'm mixing and essentially it does get down to binaural at some point, but I'm staying as ambisonic as I can so that I'm using tools like Deer VR to mix with where I'm able to place mono um, sources all around a 3D environment. Um, so that is one of the like kind of main places that I'm really excited about, uh, in terms of like what I've been doing, I've been doing like training videos and, uh, the occasional kind of creative work too. Um, so anyways, that's a really exciting area that, that I, I think is really moving right now. I like that question, age bias. That's right. No, even on the programming side, if you're the one 20 year old unpaid interns for five years. Yeah, I mean, I think that most people in that area are not doing unpaid internships. I could be wrong, but um, everything that I've seen has been kind of like entry, entry level. Do you have a little portfolio? Do you have a little experience? Uh, they're looking for people fresh out of college. They're looking for people fresh out of graduate school who have a love for games. I mean, really, that's that's kind of what it boils down to. Like, do you love playing games? Are you really into this? If so, there is a hell of a market out there for finding jobs. Uh, job postings. Yep. Okay. Uh, there are websites like, um, what is it? Sound Lister, I think it is. Um, yeah, soundlister.com is a really good uh, source. I've also How found do... uh, Hey Audio Student to be pretty good. Oh yeah, yeah. The the Facebook group that John Crivet runs. Um, if you if you watch that that website, John, like, and you kind of, I haven't done it personally, but I know that Soundlister has, where they've kind of looked at the quantity of jobs and where they are located, not geographically, but like what interest area they're in this is why i am so hot on this idea is that the most of the jobs that you guys could be like looking at right now that are paid gigs like when you get out of school are in this area are in video games and ar vr they really are they really are um i'm curious about creative versus technical skills in in this sort mm -hmm. of area and you know because i think uh, a lot of the students coming out of here start they, they come in with creative skills for sure. Yep. And then as they stick around, they, they start really diving into technical skills. And I'm sometimes at a loss as, as to what to advise somebody about what to focus on, because it's lately for me seems like, you know, that creative skill is invaluable and you couldn't have learned that any other way besides diving in for a decade and plus. But, you know, this technical side is probably as important right now. And I don't know if that's true. I'm curious about your opinion. Well, I guess, as I said in the presentation, if you're a composer that has a strong portfolio and you know a little bit about WISE or FMOD, your job opportunities just quadrupled. You know what I mean? Like, it's just it's just like you've you've given yourself enough kind of skills that will help you be more interesting to more more employees, you know, um, and I think that you can you can stay with the creative side as much as you'd like right you can <coughs> excuse me if you if you want to um if you want to do a uh, really creative work then you attack companies that are doing really creative work right um i'm thinking of meow wolf for example if you're into like really cool creative presentations of art that people are really diving into right now, um, those uh, like kind of attraction locations that they have, um, they have one in Santa Fe and one in Denver that's coming and Las Vegas. And then there's one, they, they just bought space in DC. So um, if you're looking to do like the craziest of creative stuff, 
there are companies out there that are doing that within this space, whether it's multi-channel audio in, in a, like a live presentation or whether it's goggled or AR kind of stuff, you know, um, that is really available to you. And I think that there will always be that, right? There will always be that kind of art music side to AR, VR. There will always be that. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in that. I know my students are, but I think that, um, it's almost like you, you don't need to teach the creative side. You know what I mean, John? It's like mm. either you got it or you don't, you're going to burn the candle at both ends. If that's who you are, what I can provide is a little framework for how to make it work when you get out. Like if you need a little bit of framework for, where the money is going to come from, you know, that's kind of what I feel like I can bring to the table. It's like, you're going to be creative in whatever way you want to be creative. I can make some suggestions on what I see in the industry, like might support you. Um, but if you want to teach guitar lessons, you can totally teach guitar lessons and be a composer, you know, in the evenings, right. Or whatever you can do this and just kind of like being sure that you, you put it together that's all that really matters. And that's kind of like when we talk about entrepreneurism in the music industry, I feel like that's really what it's about. It's like, how are you, which, which hats are you going to put on, you know, that, that gets you paid and keep the food coming in that you enjoy doing. So if you don't, and this is a good example, I don't really enjoy what, um, uh, buh, 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 what Andrew was talking about. I don't really love the game audio implementation side of things as much as I am inspired by the composition side, right? So when, while I do know how to create a sound that responds to a gun trigger going off, that doesn't excite me nearly as much as creating music that is interactively delivered over a two hour period of time from 40 seconds worth of music. I think that's a fascinating uh, kind of Rubik's cube to, to solve. And I love that, that kind of comparison that, that, we made in the presentation between uh, standard classical or, or musical forms, right? And interactive music forms. Like that is like such a cool kind of get me inspired to want to do this moment as opposed to here's a spreadsheet of sound effects that you must implement into, you know, your, your middleware. And I need, I've provided you with 15 different samples of footsteps and one is on grass and one is on gravel and one is on, you know, granite. And, and I need them to be randomized so that when I hit those steps, they all sound different and it, and it responds to whichever material you're, you're standing on. Like, I know how to do that. And I think that's important, but that just doesn't inspire me to get up in the morning, you know, like, um, I'm glad that there are people out there that do that because it would be a really crappy game if it wasn't in there. <laughs> um, you know, like I play um, Call of Duty Mobile on my iPad when I want to have some downtime because I think it's a fantastic game and I like a handheld kind of device. And I do it with headphones on because I am much more effective with headphones in that game. I know exactly where the person is that's walking up on me because I can line them up in the stereo field. Right. I get them in the mono center and I know that's right where they're going to show up and I'm ready to shoot them. Another thing I love about that game is like when you walk inside of a building, the sound totally changes. When you walk inside of a small room versus a large room, the sound is different. When you're in a tunnel, it sounds different. Like that's really cool to me. Like that's that's uh, that engrosses me. It puts me into the game. Right. Um, so. I think that it's fast. It's fantastic that there are people out there that are implementing that kind of technical stuff. But for me, I still want to be on the creative side to some degree. Right. So um, I think that what we do is we offer the tools and we explain them to a level so that you can do them at, at, at either place. You can either be a technical implementer or you can be a composer that helps implement it into the into the game, too. Right. So I think that that's kind of where I sit on that on that fence is like I'm going to give you the tools and I'm going to show you how to be creative with them. And if you choose to continue being creative and that's the, your direction, you go that direction. But if you're more of a spreadsheet oriented uh, implementation person, then you go in the more technical side of things. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, you know, um, it's an amazing journey, really. Uh, you know, and, and since there's people here that are that are still in school, you know, um, I will say that when I knew 
Graham in undergraduate school at Belmont University, this is not exactly what I would have envisioned either one of us doing. So it's really interesting how things turn out. Um, you know, John, we were talking a lot, like when you went out to California, right? And you started working in this kind of computer, you were telling me about a dome with speakers everywhere and all this craziness. It was like, and the last time we like worked together, you were rapping on a song, right? <laughs> that we were performing and you were like, yeah against the administration of the university or whatever right and like so to see that comparison like this is where you ended up and this is where i ended up i totally agree i totally agree and so it's like where does that creativity take you right it takes you to different places uh, some of it might be entrepreneur entrepreneurial in in kind of like its motivation like you got to get a job at some point you, so it helps to have some degrees and stuff like that and you can't really get a degree in in rapping against the administration of a university so you chose to do it, do it in uh you know you learn programming and stuff like that but um you know cool right i think that's cool i think it's cool it's kind of shows that there is light at the end of the tunnel that you don't have to just do classical guitar, right? You don't have to do, I mean, I was a commercial music major. I don't have to just play guitar, right? I don't have to just play keyboards. I can uh, learn a new instrument that's a push oriented instrument, right? A, a, a pad oriented instrument. I can, I can take my creativity and not have to leave it at the I don't have to leave it when I wake up. I, if I had an, a, a programming job, I would be making a lot more money, but I don't think that I would still want to like wake up in the morning and like go to work, right? So when I go to work, I get to talk about stuff that I'm excited about. I get to share like kind of like stuff like this, that like I'm still learning. I'm still like diving into stuff all the time. And in particular, just to rehash it, what really got me the most excited about this was truly the comparison to musical forms. I was like, oh, crap, that's really cool. Like, I'm really inspired by that. I'm really inspired by the idea that this is the same as a 12 bar blues, right? This is the same as a rondo. Like, that's cool. Like, that's like not leaving what I learned in college, you know, I, I hate the idea of like wasted energy, you know, like I don't want to waste energy learning the Rondo form. I want to see how I can m make it applicable to what I'm doing today. That's amazing. Great stuff. And, you know, it, it reminds me of open form from the 50s and 60s and how that's applicable to game audio as well. And that interests me. Um, well, with that, I think I'm going to leave the Facebook audience uh, now. So goodbye, people on Facebook. Uh, I, how do I do that? Stop that one. And now we're just recording here so we can edit out whatever we want. <laughs> and uh, I'll just open it up to, to everybody. If anybody has any more questions, you can just unmute and, and ask the questions. I, have I do question. have an example session from Ableton Live I can pull up to um, just stuff, some stuff that I've just, it's nothing special, but it's kind of cool to see it like in a DAW. Go ahead, Andrew, sorry. Um, so. I've been trying to get into game sound design and um, I'm working on a, on a small indie game, but I've been trying to do game jams for a while now. And it always feels like it's oversaturated with audio people. You try and hop on one and they already have five. And, and you know, and I have experience with wise and experience working on games before, and it still seems fairly difficult to find gigs because there's just so much competition. So what would you recommend uh, how to find those gigs, how to find those jobs, or do I have to change something to stand out more to beat the competition? Mm. Well, I think that the way that you've, you've teamed up with an, an indie developer, that kind of is the next level, right? The game jam is kind of get your feet wet, maybe meet some people in this situation, right? Maybe you've met a developer that you can kind of start working with. I think that's really what it is. It's like kind of like a networking tool to kind of like just open the doors. So the other thing that I would say is that the game jam also provides you the opportunity to find people that you don't want to work with. Right. <laughs> it's like, it's like, Oh, that guy's a jerk. I'm not going to do that. Like I'm not yeah. interested. 
working with that person, but this artist over here that was doing like hand drawn or, you know, whatever, uh, material that was submitting animations or whatever, I'm going to keep that person's resume and contact information so that then I can, if I, if I get to the point where I need to reach out and put together a team, um, I can do that. But I think that, um, the game jam is like dip your toe in kind of thing. Um, and also start to network. Um, and if you organize your own game jam, then maybe you're more in control too, right? Where you're like, I only need two audio people. And <laughs> really what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a location sound audio person and not an implementer like I am. So that way our skill sets are complementary, you know, um, st stuff like that. I'm just throwing out ideas, but um, kind of what I would say is like, it's a networking tool to get you in the door. Awesome. Thank you. On and that just one second, Ryan. Also, um, the things like the game sound con, um, just being at that, if you can go or being online with it, I think that also that's another great kind of networking opportunity because you see other people who are doing what you're doing and it's like, okay, if I network with that person, then maybe they have some extra work that they can throw my way. And all of a sudden my portfolio is larger. For sure. That's actually how I got this indie gig. I went to the last three game sound cons and all of my work has been through people I networked with. Very good. Look at you, Andrew. Man, you <laughs> way, buddy. I mean, as as John can attest, like it's gonna take a little bit of um, water and bread to get you out there, right? And to to make it happen. And we all we all recognize that, you know. Like it's nothing is like instant, but it sounds like to me you're developing a portfolio in a network that will allow you to, to land that entry level or kind of mid level job. If you want that, if you want that, if you want to work for somebody else, then that could be a possibility here. It sounds like to me, I'm sorry, Ryan. So I'm in the, I make like plugins. I do audio programming or I want to, but I, I mean, I am not tied to that and I'm at the point where I'm ready to get a job. Uh, before I'm 30, like in the, in the career that I want to be in. And so I'm thinking like, well, I don't care what I'm programming, you know, at a certain point, I'm just handling objects and object oriented programming. So, I mean, should I not specify, should I not specialize in audio? Should I just do game programming in general? Like, would there be more opportunities for me? Cause I don't feel a compromise in doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's definitely more jobs in game and game programming than game audio. Yeah. But like specifically audio programming, is it better for me to have a specialty of like, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very good. And I know everything about audio programming because I thought that each game would build their own audio engine, but it sounds like wise is the audio engine. You know, uh, it's not to say that FMOD isn't used as well, but I think that um, the statistics that I always hear people quote is that the major studios that are really employing people either are using WISE or they've written their own. You know, like EA, I think, has their own, and some of the bigger companies have their own that they've written. Um, but it does seem like WISE has become kind of like the, the, the de facto for a lot of these um, companies. And as Andrew mentioned the implementation jobs are probably more frequent than the composition jobs. So if you look into, in particular, there's a couple of certifications that WISE has that are uh, uniquely involved with integrating WISE with Unity or integrating WISE into Unreal. If you start to really specialize in those areas, I've, I mean, this is just kind of based on the job descriptions that I've been reading. There's more jobs in those areas of the implementing and the programming, right? Because there's, I mean, unfortunately, we like to think of WISE or FMOD as being the ultimate, you know, solution of getting audio into video games, but there's always going to be something, some little tweak that a programmer is going to have to do, right? Is there yeah. always going to be something in there? And so, if you come at it from that standpoint, I think that there's more jobs in audio implementation or technical audio um, applications uh, than there are in the creative side. So if you want to focus on implementing WISE into the video game engine, that is exactly, I would say, where the funnel is the largest in that area. But so compared, though, as 
let's forget about composition and just say audio programming versus like graphics programming. Would it be worth it for me to start fresh with like OpenGL and understanding that? Is it that much more valuable than audio or is there an equal demand for audio engineers or audio programmers as there is for people in the graphics department? I mean, I think that all the other aspects of gaming are larger than audio and the, the, the departments, you know, all the departments that do animation, all the departments that are doing uh, the programming, all the departments that are dealing with AI and physics and all those kind of sides of the gaming engine. Those are larger in terms of the number of people at any any of the major uh, studios. So there are undoubtedly are more opportunities in those areas. That said, a lot of schools that are diving into that. So there's just like Indiana graduates way too many, you know, uh, contrabassoon majors for the for the demand. Uh, Michigan State is probably turning out a lot of animators and a lot of uh, you know video implementers and stuff like that. So it's not to say that the there's not a, a large pool of people coming out that have training in it. Um, but there are more jobs, so yeah. it, it's not like the NFL, right? It's not like going to chunk down to like three jobs like it would for a contrabassoonist. <clears throat> okay. Sorry if that's your instrument. No. <laughs> You're muted there, John. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask about, you mentioned um, using MIDI in WISE and it talking to synths that are loaded in somewhere. And I, I'm not really familiar with that. I was wondering if you could enlighten me. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's a kind of a unique place, um, kind of in, in, in an Apple vibe. Uh, WISE is a pretty strong gatekeeper. Um, they do not allow you to use AUs or VSTs. Um, so that's true on plugins as well as, as uh, virtual instruments. And so, Ryan, you might look into developing plugins for WISE. I think that there's a real opportunity there to yeah. develop plugins for WISE that are lower cost than what it comes with. <laughs> because, Is it like uh, VSTs? Or yeah, I mean, it's not exactly a VST um, shell, but I think that it's there. there's lots of uh, documentation on how to create um, plugins for wise. And I think just even just in the past three weeks or so, there's been, uh, uh, an hour long webinar about that. So, um, so that might be something to look into. Um, I think that that's an area that's kind of relatively untapped and there's lots of cool angles that people are, are looking into. Um, for example, with spatialization, um, localization, there's lots of cool things that people are doing there with beam forming and bounces and all this kind of stuff, like really interesting stuff. And so, depending on where your area of interest lies. I mean, me personally, I'm more interested in um, what synths are available inside of WISE and how do I control them, right? So um, there's not a ton of synths that can live inside of WISE, but there's one in particular that I use a lot that's free, right? So um, that is a, a good example, I think, of where you could have some decent sounds come out of WISE that you were in full control over and in terms of variability, that's kind of the answer, John. It's like, man, I mean, I'm, I'm going to bake in something in Ableton Live, right? But if I have a synthesizer in Wise, then I can fully be in control of the timbres and textures that are coming out of that synthesizer. Like all of a sudden, it's much more flexible on that kind of micro level, I guess you could say. Right. So currently what you would do is like, let's say I have FM8, as a standalone and then I would route that to wise, but then with that, uh, what is it? The RPTC or the, the parameter control, you couldn't really control all the aspects of FM8. You could just manipulate the audio that came out of it. Correct. Right? Okay. So yeah, so you really do need a synth in wise to have true control of the parameters. Yeah, yeah, because the parameters that you kind of have access to would be like volume, reverb that's added by Wise, any EQ, like a real yeah. common one is the uh, the filters, right? So as something gets closer to you, you open up the filter of the sound that it's emitting. It's just very simple kind of ways of localizing sound that way. Um, 
But yeah, yeah, you you get the idea. You're you're baking in wave files that then you're importing into Wise otherwise. <laughs> yeah, which is that you really lose a lot then of the things that I would want to control. Absolutely. Yeah, the problem yep. with external things like FM8 is that they will not be folded into the game when it's delivered, right? So oh. if, yeah. if you want a synth in Wise, right? If you're controlling a synth in Wise, I believe it's the case that it's folded into the package when it's delivered. So you can just have MIDI that talks to it. Um, so developing synth plugins for Wise it seems like a pretty good market in my opinion. I don't know of many, for instance. I think there's only two. Um, there's one that uh, comes with Wise, and then the other one's name is just escaping me. Maybe Andrew can remember it. It's like uh, what's so cool about the one the, the one that I'm thinking of that works in in Wise is that it's free, and that it also has a VST AU, so you can manipulate it in your DAW and kind of like get it close to what you want it to be, and then you bring it into Wise, and it's the exact same thing. So it's like right. it's ideal for developing that way. Yeah. So I guess there's probably just a wise SDK and you just have to learn how to right. uh, build it. You got it. Yep. I'm sure that's true. I'm sure that's true. Well, we've reached three o'clock. So I think that's the end of our time. Can I ask one more important question? No, please. Yes. How did you make this presentation? It looked really nice and the transitions were good and stuff. And I was wondering, I, I, I'm a fiend for a good uh, PowerPoint. So I'm in keynote. I switched over to keynote about six years ago and kind of never looked back. I know there's some cool things that PowerPoint can do that Keynote cannot, but I don't really care. I'm over it. I'm 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 not into PowerPoint. I I hate that program. It's kind of like Finale. It's like I'll never go back to Finale. Okay. <laughs> I just offended John, but I don't care. <laughs> I cannot stand Finale. Yeah, I'm not a big fan either. It's like yeah. it's like how, how unintuitive can you make a program? You know, like how much like Photoshop can you make a music program? That's terrible. I hate that stuff. You got to protect all those engraver jobs. If it was easy <laughs> to learn, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All those engraver jobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you liked uh, my use of um, Dr. Thompson's music in this presentation. That took at least 45 seconds for me to put together. I like that a lot. <laughs> I always try that you know like i do these presentations to different um ableton user groups all over the country and so like i had the opportunity to, to do one in detroit and i was like sweet yeah. i got Detroit. so i found like an old um techno tune by cybertron uh like the original techno guys right and um did the exact same thing where i showed like the timeline and showed like how they were layering in a similar way that wasn't the best example john because you didn't layer it like very well but other than that <laughs> What's well, good for the multiple time signatures? I got that one in yeah. there. Yes, yes. I actually still love that tune, though. I love that song. That's a good one. Well, you know, you guys had a great band. That was amazing. And you know, like like we were talking about, things haven't changed very much. It turns out, you were ahead of your yeah. time. Yeah. Welcome to the first workshop of. Okay. Well, I do wish that I was playing more. Um, but I think the reality of having two kids and kind of putting all of this all of this together is like. And I'll say this to you students, man, like I did it, you know, I did it before I switched to academia. And that for me was really, really important. Like I took from this guitar teacher at Belmont and I went to go, he was my, you know, I was majoring in guitar actually, and he was my main guy and I went to see him play and he choked on the bandstand multiple times I saw him play. And I was like, why am I studying with you, dude? I don't care how many scales, you know, if you can't play, I am so uninterested. Right. And so same thing, like I got a chance to run sound at the Hollywood bowl and like at Madison square garden. It's like, okay, if I say that this is how it's done at least 10 years ago, like that was how it was done. Right. Like I'm not making that up. And so I feel like I got the opportunity to like focus on myself and do what I needed for myself. And then it was time to maybe back off of that a little bit and like share what I had done with other people and kind of get inspired by you all too, right? Like I, I learn about so much music from my students now that makes me inspired. And it's like, how did, like last year, how did, how did Billie Eilish get this bass sound? And I'm like, who? 
you know, and I listened to it. And I'm like, holy crap, how did they get that bass sound, right? Like, like it's really, I think that's kind of fun stuff, right? It's fun stuff to be inspired by people around you. And oftentimes I think we forget that the music industry is really driven by new blood. Like we're all, we're all to the point where we're kind of bored and tired with what we do. And we need people that are younger than us and more excited about music to come along and share that excitement with us. And then it reminds us why we're in it and it gets us back in it, right? But otherwise we're kind of dormant old men, uh, <laughs> old white men in this case, right? Like, so it's just like, yeah. oh God, here we go with this again, you know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You're right. <laughs> but so don't forget, like that, that is a really important thing that students bring to the table that you kind of forget is like just your level of like excitement and inspiration about music reminds older folks that are in the music industry that we still want to be in it you know and it reminds us that that we're that we need to work with people like you to keep that fire to keep that flame flame lit absolutely well with that i'm going to end the recording now and uh...